Welcome to another installment of... Really? Oh well, you're cute, you can have some pats. Show the world your butthole. Welcome to another installment of Friday q and I hope you've all had a fantastic week. We had a little bit of a break or diversion from the regular Q&A videos. I did a mini studio tour, kind of broke down what is and isn't on my desk. Uh, at the moment, there's not a cat on my desk, but there probably will be over the course of this video. So stay tuned. Uh, what else did I do? Had the amp video last week where I talked about my favorite amps. I've been super busy making content. It feels like the time of year is right for new product releases. A lot of new stuff dropped in September and there's a lot of stuff coming up in October that I'm super excited to talk about. There's some really, really fun videos and uh, ideas for other videos as well. I do have to say a massive shout out to all my amazing patrons who continue to support me over on Patreon. If you want to sign up to Patreon, click the link in the video description and to everybody who has gone out and bought some ragdoll music and merch recently, I say a massive thank you as well. If you want to check that out, as always, it's in the video description, including the link to my Discord server, which you can join for free and my free cabinet IRs. I'm going to start off with some questions from my patrons, and then I'll try to get to a few other questions that have been posed on the channel. If you've got a question you would like me to answer on the next Q&A video, simply put it in the comment section below. Let's go. This one comes from Marcelo, friend of the channel, long-standing patron and supporter. Marcelo wants to know about my opinions on zero frets and whether I think they change the tone of a guitar. I feel like this would be a relatively easy one to do as an experiment. I'm looking at you, Jim Lil, you absolute madman, uh, where you could have a guitar with a nut and a zero fret and simply just pop this fret in and out. And I think you might notice a bit of a tone change, but also I'm totally open to being wrong about that. I feel like any guitar with a zero fret that I have played has a lot of other design elements that go along with it that contribute to the overall sound and playability of that guitar. So just isolating it as a zero fret thing, I think would be pretty tricky to do. Having said that, the guitars with zero frets that I've played, I've really liked and it makes a lot of sense to me. It takes out some of the uncertainty that you can get from a guitar with a poorly cut nut. I feel like if you're able to fret the rest of the guitar, just adding a zero fret in there is probably an easier process than getting the nut right. Uh, the Rubato Lassi guitar that you've seen on the channel and you'll be seeing some more of very soon. Uh, don't want to say too much about that, but I'm very excited about what's coming up with that. It has a zero fret on it and the rest of that guitar is just so immaculately put together that the zero fret feels right and they've got a kind of custom string guide on there as well rather than just a traditional nut. And I think that definitely contributes to some of the playability on that guitar. If you've ever played a standard electric guitar with a capo on it, even if you put the capo at the first fret and you play the rest of the guitar, you know, the action's a little bit different and it just kind of changes the vibe a little bit. So whether the tonal difference is something that couldn't be fixed by like twisting the treble knob by, you know, a bee's dick either way, not too sure, it would be a fun little experiment to do though. This next one comes from Felipe, one of my patrons who has got an FM3 and some Strymon pedals. I just wanna say straight up, great choice in gear, Felipe. That is some of the very best sounding and best made stuff out there. You wanna know how to hook that up and avoid any tone sucking issues. I actually did a video a couple of days ago using pedals with the FM9 and I went through a bunch of different setups, like a mono setup in front of an amp, a mono setup after an amp, a stereo setup before amps and after amps and how you can manage that signal flow on your unit, you should be able to go through that video. And I think I was using input and output three on the FM9, just use input and output two on your FM3. There are a few extra settings on the FM3 which make it easier to set up for Unity gain. I would highly recommend you can go and read the wiki or you can go and check out the forum for some extra tips on there. But set it up for Unity gain on there and you can read the manual as well, but you know, who reads the manual? That's what my videos are for. And hopefully that will make some sense. If you don't, feel free to reach out. To this one comes from my buddy, Rutger, a longtime supporter of the channel. And they wanna know my thoughts on where I see the pedal market going. Is there really a future for the guitar pedal market given that modelers and profilers and capture devices do so much now? And is there anything that I think those modelers, profilers or capture devices can't do 
that pedals can do. I first want to get to the idea with like modelers and capture devices all being one big blob of a thing. They don't all do the same thing. You know, if you look at something like the Axe Effects, the effect selection is incredibly large, but it's also a modular system where you can use combinations of blocks to kind of create your own custom effect algorithm. So if you looked at something like the Strymon Night Sky, for example, so you've got a reverb pedal, you've got a sequencer, it gives you a lot of control over the way you can build a reverb. Something like that you could do in the Axe, or something like the Strymon Volante, you could do something very similar, but the user experience is gonna be very different or even like the Eventide H90, there's some awesome combination algorithms in there, which I've been able to replicate in the Axe FX and I really enjoy them and I've AB'd them extensively and feel like I've got really, really close, but you know, I might have to use three or four blocks in the Axe and save them to my blocks library and anytime I wanna add them to a preset, I've gotta recall those blocks and cable them in. Whereas with the H90 or a Strymon pedal or something like that, you just plug it in, you turn it on, you twist a few knobs, and then you're good to go. So I think the fundamental division there is about the user experience. And if you look at modeling devices, like the Fractal does so much, but it doesn't have captures, and then something like, I don't know, a Quad Cortex has captures and amp modeling and a bunch of stuff, but it doesn't really have the depth or breadth of effects that you can get out of an Axe effects. And then you've got stuff like the Hot Tone Ampera Mini that I did a video with recently, which is so affordable, and it kind of covers all the major food groups groups, but you know, you're limited with options and there's not MIDI and there's not a bunch of other stuff on there. So it's such a big world in the sort of modeling universe that at the moment, I struggle to see how any one modeler could successfully replicate everything out there. Another good example would be most modelers, you can get glitch style effects out of them. But if you compare them to say something like a hologram microcosm, that is laid out in a way that is designed to just be super inspiring. And the idea is you kind of plug it in and it works like an instrument almost into itself. And again, I'm fairly confident I could design an Axe FX patch or even on a Helix or a Quad Cortex, something that can do some glitchy fun stuff and just use that patch whenever I want to bliss out. But there is something to be said about, you know, a musician having a bunch of different instruments and a bunch of different things and a bunch of different workflows. I think the workflow thing is the big one that still differentiates pedals and amps and modelers and plugins. So that's not to say that in five years, all of this stuff will reach some singularity and I'll be totally wrong, but that's kind of where I see it at the moment. A lot of pedals, they're either gonna be offering your main food groups at increasingly affordable prices. There's the Wampler pedals that are built internationally. JHS 3 Series, a bunch of brands coming out of China doing modelers and effects at absolute bargain basement prices. But then you've got other, let's call them say, boutique brands. I don't really like the label boutique, but if you think of a company like Strymon or Empress or Meris or Chase Bliss, where they're kind of about the pedals and the people making them and the community of people around them. That's one thing that I really like about the Fractal stuff, for example, is that the community historically has been really open to sharing things in there. So I hope going forward, modelers keep that community aspect of it. I hope that pedal builders continue to make fun stuff that is inspiring to use. And I hope that the budget options that are available for everybody that, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats in that kind of case where it's not just a case of if you've got $500, you basically can't afford anything that sounds half decent. Hopefully the budget options will, you know, only differ from the high end stuff by, you know, how many instances of something can you run or how many different types of chorus do you have in there or what kind of NAM profile can you run? Can it run full captures or nano captures or all that kind of stuff? I don't know, I have a lot of thoughts about it. Uh, I just like stuff, so for me, I'm fairly optimistic about it, that you know, stuff is cool and cool people will make more cool stuff. But I wanna hear from all of you now, where do you think the pedal market is going? And what do you think, you know, guitar effects and that entire space will look like in say 10 to 20 years? All right, this one comes from H, who was recently signed up to my Patreon. They wanna know about 
scallops or scallops. Uh, I did a video breaking down Yngwie's Far Beyond the Sun recently over on the Patreon and I was playing this guitar. This is my kind of semi YJM guitar. It's a YJM neck and pick guard on a Warmoth Mary Kay White Ash body. I've uh, told the story about that guitar before, but it's interesting how this comes together. Uh, the main thing with a fully scallop neck to me is, you know, if you play a traditional Strat and you want to bend on the high E string, uh, sometimes, especially on guitars that have a small radius, it kind of either feels like your fingers can't get a proper grip on the string or that your finger like runs into fretboard on it. So for me, and I've heard Ingve say this as well, it just kind of helps you get a better grip on the string. And what I've noticed for me is it helps me play with a lighter touch on there. It's basically like having gigantic frets. So uh, I don't have this plugged in rather foolishly, but you know, you've got no wood in there. So when you kind of play the note on there, this may not be a very good visual at all. Uh, basically, you can push the string and it's just gonna follow the fret. It's gonna fret out a little bit less. Your finger can kind of actually move in there and not run into fretball, which is a feeling that I really don't like, especially on guitars with really small frets. So yeah, if you wanna do the big Ingve vibrato or the big overbends. <laughs> This one comes from Holger, who's another patron and friend of the channel. How would I recommend going about learning keyboards for somebody who's never really played it before? If you've tried the kind of, you know, classical guitar keys courses and they're just way too advanced or they contain way more stuff than you would ever want to use, my advice would be just go and learn some songs. You know, if somebody wanted to learn to play rock guitar, you'd probably hand them a set of strings and a pick and maybe hopefully a multi-effects and a tuner and a loud amp or something like that and say, go and learn some Zeppelin and some Sabbath and some Deep Purple. Go and learn the songs that are synonymous with that genre. So if you're sick of sitting at a DAW and plugging in just like, you know, long strips of chords in there and you actually want to play some stuff, just knowing how to build triads, knowing how to play in a couple of different keys and knowing some kind of fun tricks from some of your favorite songs might be a really good way to do that, I've been trying to learn songs like Jump by Van Halen and Separate Ways by Journey on my Hydra synth. And, you know, they're right at that level for me where they're just slightly above my technical ability. So that makes me want to keep diving in and practicing. I'm definitely not confident enough to play them in a live setting, but if I'm sitting around here and I want to play some keys on a track and then like fix it up and quantize it later, that's really the level I want to be at as a keyboard player. So it doesn't take too much to wrap your head around triads and, you know, extensions and things like that. Stuff you already know on the guitar, figure it out on the keys and just go and learn a few basic songs. There's so many tutorials online where you can see how to play this stuff. And I think you'll make some really great progress really, really quickly. And the beauty of it is if you record it all by MIDI, yeah, you make a few mistakes on the chords, you just fix them up later and it's all good. New techniques that I have learned semi recently that I felt have kind of improved my playing. I've spent a lot of time revisiting stuff like my alternate picking technique and my left hand technique. There's a great video done a year or two ago by Tom Quayle talking about lazy first finger syndrome. And I've been watching a lot of David Beebe's videos on Legato uh, where you kind of do this sort of run where you might hammer on to a new string from nowhere with your ring finger or your pinky, but then you play a line where you're doing a one fret pull off to your first finger and that kind of frees up your left hand. So you kind of like compress and expand. I've been spending a lot of time on that kind of stuff. You know, Tom, BB, Jake Wilson, John Cordy, all these guys, there must be something in the water in the UK where they're all just amazing legato players. So I've spent a lot of time on the legato stuff there. And then the alternate picking stuff, you know, the Troy Grady cracking the code stuff. I haven't done any of the courses, but it's like an awareness thing. When you're aware of certain tendencies you might have with your playing, then that makes it a lot easier to actually practice specific stuff and work on it. So I've gone back and I've been revisiting stuff like Paul Gilbert's Intense Rock. And I feel like maybe my overall speed hasn't improved, but my accuracy has massively improved and my consistency has improved with that stuff. Uh, the other technique that is just something that is always ongoing is trying to be as relaxed as possible when playing, you know, 
trying to play with the lightest touch possible so that if you do want to ramp it up for other things, you've got that option in there. I spoke on the gear podcast recently about, you know, when I was a teenager, I would just try to play with maximum intensity at all times because I thought that would convey intensity and conviction. But when I listened to my playing, I just kind of sounded rushed and out of tune. So they're always ongoing things. And that's kind of the bedrock of what I'm trying. What would my musical dream team of legendary musicians who have passed away be? I will assume that I'm going to play guitar in this and this is some kind of all-star jam that I can attend. I'm a Rush fan, a massive Rush fan, so kneel on drums immediately. When I think of my favourite singers, particularly rock singers, Ronnie James Dio is right at the top of that list. So Neil and Ronnie as the two big pillars in there. On bass, well, we're going to go with Cliff. So let's go Cliff Burton on bass. And for keyboards, I will add some prog flair in there and Keith Emerson because Keith was kind of the Jimi Hendrix of synthesis. Is that a thing? Or the Hammond organ? Uh, I just love old Emerson, Lake and Palmer and you know, like just Keith absolutely savaging the instruments he was playing. He was such a great showman. So that would either be one of those situations where you'd have the greatest time of your life and everybody would play for the song and have a lot of fun or it would be a total disaster because everybody in that band would be such an identifiable presence. I always feel like in any kind of band, uh, you know, even if it's a trio or it's something like, you know, as big as a six or seven piece, everybody's got to play their role in a band. So the all-star dream team thing, that would be for me. What about for you? Let me know who some of your favorite musos you would, uh, you would love to have been able to see Jam together. That is it for this week's Q&A. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, if you've got a question for the next Q&A video, put it in the comment section below. If you wanna come and join the Patreon, it is linked in the video description. If you wanna come and join the Discord, it's linked in the video description. And if you wanna hear some of the music that I like to make with my band Ragdoll, it is available on all the major streaming platforms. You can support us directly by checking the link in the video description. Have yourself a great week. Go and make some weird guitar noises and I'll see you all next time. Cheers.